Hello, welcome to the Bureau of Economic Geology's Austin Earth Science Zoomorama. In today's presentation, we will hear from Raymond Slade Jr. Raymond is a certified hydrologist and adjunct professor at Austin Community College. Today, Raymond will be talking to us in his presentation entitled, Water Resources in Texas, Issues and Careers. Raymond, thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. I'll state that uh, a lot of people still don't know what a hydrologist is. Uh, when they hear the word hydro and they know it has something to do with water. But I, I just realized last month that uh, in this coming January, I, I will have been a hydrologist for 50 years. So which means I'm very old. So, um, but hydrology apparently is still important. I think water apparently is still important. And so <laughs> with that, should I go ahead and start the presentation? Yes, please. Thank you, Raymond. My pleasure. Can everybody see the screen in my pointer? Yes. Okay. Uh, as Linda said, water resources, uh, careers, issues and car uh, careers in Texas. Uh, <clears throat> this is something I provided to Linda uh, about a week ago. It's, a, uh, it's an educational resource for students and teachers on different issues of water. Uh, that, uh, but I won't go over it, of course, but uh, it's available. Here's what I'm going to talk about. How much water do we have and where is it? Uh, data collection and how we collect data regarding water and present it. And then water use, of course, we have to use water. Floods, droughts, water quality contamination, and then a brief summary on careers and water sources for those of you interested. The presentation organization, how much water do we have and where is it? A data collection and pr a presentation. A water use, we're gonna talk about that. Floods, droughts, water quality contamination, and careers uh, in water resources. First of all, how much water do we have and where is it? This is a picture of an, of an old bridge. I think this was taken from Ireland. A friend of mine sent me this years ago that shows the bridge, but the stream is over here. Uh, I've had uh, one student years ago jokingly asked me, he said, did an Aggie build a bridge and miss the water? <laughs> but I don't think that's the case. This is uh, a lot of streams move around. They don't stay in the same place. So uh, streams can move. First of all, where does our water come from in Texas? <clears throat> we can do what we call a water budget. People know what a bank budget is. You, you put money into the bank, you take money out of the bank, you have money stored in the bank. Well, in Texas, 99% of the water that enters this state comes from precipitation that falls on the state. Only 1% comes from other states. So we're very dependent on precipitation. And because of that, when, it, uh, when there's a drought, we experience it very rapidly because we have very, very few water, very little water flowing through our state. Where does the water go? 90% <clears throat> of the water entering the state is lost as what's called evapotranspiration. That is evaporation, which I think most of you probably know what that is. And transpiration is the water used by plants. So because of that, only about 10% of the precipitation that falls on the state is available for use. So we uh, there's <clears throat> so during a drought, uh, we have very little water available and this is the major reason why. Where is the water? We have two places. There's groundwater and surface water. Of course, groundwater is stored in what's called aquifer and there's aquifers all over the state. And of course we have to pump it out of the ground to get it. And then of course, surface water sort in streams and reservoirs. So uh, that's the two sources uh, where we get our water. And there's uh, just about an equal amount of water being used in this state from surface water and groundwater. So we're dependent on both sources. Data collection. It's important to collect data regarding water. We need to know how much water is available and what's that quality. So one thing we can do is we can measure the flow. It's called a discharge. How many gallons per minute, for example, is flowing down a stream? So there's ways we can do that, and that data is posted online. Uh, also, we collect reservoir water levels, and we know how much water is stored in real time uh, in reservoirs, as well as stream flow. So it's important to know that. Regarding groundwater, 
uh, because the water's in the ground, we can't get to it, but we can measure the depth to the water in the wells. So we know how deep the water is in the wells. And we know, we know with uh, some certainty how much water is available in the aquifers. Uh, there's a lot more air involved in that than surface water, but we do have a, a way we can access uh, uh, and determine groundwater availability. Uh, regarding water quality, it's very simple in a stream. We can just take a sample with a bottle. In reservoirs, the boats are used for that. And for groundwater, <clears throat> we have to lower something down into a well to pump water out to get a sample from the water, of groundwater. The data are presented online in real time and historic data <clears throat> is available. All that data is available. Uh, the US Geological Survey <clears throat> is the main source for much of that data, but a lot of it's also available through the Texas Water Development Board, uh, River Authorities and, and others in Texas. But um, there's, it's very accessible, the data. Data presentation, uh, data are used in reports, talks, graphs, and tables. For example, here's a, a presentation of groundwater levels in a well up in the Panhandle and it was called the Ogallala Aquifer. And this is the depth to water versus, versus the date. And as you can see here, the water uh, in that well is dropping continually for many years. So water level in the Panhandle is definitely being reduced over time, mostly due to, to large pumpage. Water use. <clears throat> Availability and needs, water use is how much water do we consume. Availability is how much is available in the stream, reservoir, ground, and water needs, how much water we need for the future. Those are three important issues that are addressed by the Texas Water Development Board, for example, and their Texas Water Plan that, that produces all this data every few years. This is an example of a misunderstanding of, of a water of a source. This is an actual, very old letter. It's about 40 years old, probably. Uh, <clears throat> regarding a, a letter in response by the mayor of, of city of Savoy, Texas, that says the city of Savoy does not use ground and surface water. We use water pump from a water tower. So that's an example of a misunderstanding. I, I assume that shortly after that, the mayor realized that the water in that water tower had to come from somewhere else. <laughs> but, yeah. but I think it's kind of humorous. Uh, water use categories, there's a, a lot of different uses for water, public supply, domestic, commercial, irrigation, industrial, thermoelectric, and so forth. So as you can see, it's more than just for drinking. There's a lot of different port uses for water, uh, so we can't do without it, of course. This is a, a graphic, interesting graphic from the Texas Water Plan I was talking about. That They project in the water plan future availability, and this is a by county for the year 2050. And this is a horrible scale over here, but uh, what it shows is that all these counties with the color represent counties that are gonna have water shortages in the future, and that includes Travis County. So, uh, and, and there, a drought in the future, if, if we have a drought by 2050, we're gonna be short of water. Floods, uh, that is a very important topic in Texas. This is a picture of the Congress Avenue during the 1935 flood. You can see the state capitol and Congress Avenue, of course, is underwater. There was only one reservoir on the river at the time. That was uh, what's now Lake uh, Austin and the dam failed uh, during this flood. Guess what, 1936 and next year it happened again. There's a flood over Congress Avenue that separated the city. And in 1938, it happened again. So finally, we're, we're sometimes slow to learn but finally, after the 38 flood of uh, Lake Buchanan construction was started and it was built, and of course, this hasn't happened since. Between Lake uh, Travis uh, and Buchanan, uh, there's enough storage now to prevent this from happening again. Why do we have big floods in Texas? One of them is what I call rain bombs. These are some world record rainfall rates. For example, New Brunswick, 1972, 12 inches in one hour. This is a well-known flood nationally, 1921 in Thrall, Texas, north of here, 32 inches in 12 hours. So you can see we have many uh, uh, records, world record uh, rainfall rates, and that's one of the main reasons we have so many floods in Texas. 
there's big floods just about every year in Texas, somewhere uh, around the state. So uh, we don't escape that. <clears throat> Most of you probably remember Hurricane Harvey just a few years ago. It flooded almost every city along the Colorado River downstream from Austin, including Bastrop, Smithfield, LaGrange, and Wharton. This is LaGrange. Of course, people realize uh, Houston got flooded, and that was the big issue, but uh, it wasn't just Houston that got flooded. This is one of my favorite flood photos. This was taken in Houston, 1994. Um, there was a flood coming down the, the river. What happened, the flood apparently breached the pipeline. The oil was floating, and I don't think they knew how it happened, but the oil uh, got ignited. So you had this uh, a flood and a fire uh, floating down the river. I sent this picture to many of my comrades in other states, and I said, only in Texas do we have flood and fires at the same time in the same place. Uh, just off the screen here, there's a, a motel. Uh, so that motel got flooded and burned at the same time. So can you imagine the insurance claim on that? June 19, uh, 2001, there was a tropical storm, Allison, Houston, 23 deaths, $5 billion worth of damage. But that was pale compared to Hur Hurricane uh, Harvey in 2017. Uh, a over 100,000 homes were impacted, $190 billion in damages. Uh, and this is excess damages. It was probably much greater than this. This is the reality of what happened, folks, when floods like uh, Harvey happened. This is a shelter for flood victims uh, in Houston who were living here for a long a duration, long duration after the flood. This is the reality of, of floods. In Austin, we've had our share of floods 2013 on Halloween on Onion Creek, 1,200 homes inundated. Uh, and then just almost two years later to the date, there was another flood almost as high. So many of these people rebuilt got back in the same homes that got flooded again. After this 2015 flood, the city started a buyout program. So uh, most of those homes are gone now between city taxpayer dollars and federal. They bought out most of these homes and vacated them because it's on, all in the floodplain. Early Texas flood warning forecast. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, there's a uh, small town in North Texas called Fort Griffin. It was back in the Western days, uh, 100, 150 years ago. Uh, it was known as the roughest town in the West. There were people like Wide Earp and Doc Holliday occupied the town. Um, there was a, it was near the uh, Clear Fork of the Brazos River. It's again, north of here. There was an, a Native American tribe called the Tonkawa that were encamped, that lived uh, near the river. They used the river for the water source, of course. And they were a friendly tribe. Many of the Tonkawa uh, natives served as scouts for the soldiers at Fort Griffin. Well, July 1876, there was a huge flood on the river. And I don't think that flood's been exceeded since then. But just prior to that flood, the chief moved the entire Tonkawa encampment to a nearby hilltop and avoided the flood just before it happened. Well, a few years later, the U.S. Geological Survey was founded. And of course, they heard about this story and they were very interested. So they sent a hydrologist to meet that chief who was still alive. And they asked that chief, of course, one important question, how did you know that flood was gonna happen? Um, and the chief responded that he followed the animals and insects to high ground. So basically the chief was saying that they could read uh, nature read animals and that's not unusual story folks there's people indigenous people all around the world that typically move just before hurricanes tornadoes and and so forth and that before, just before natural disasters so that's an uh, i think that's something that's not totally understood but we've lost the ability to do that floods i call this the hydroelogical cycle you may have heard of the hydrologic cycle that's evaporation rainfall and so forth but this is a re reality how we deal with floods. Uh, after a flood, shortly after that, there's people in our panic. And with more passage of time, that typically becomes concern. And with more passage, that becomes awareness. And then with more passage later, it becomes apathy until the next flood happens. And then the cycle starts over. 
So unfortunately, this is the reality is how we deal with floods. Drought, that's also an important issue in Texas. where We have a lot of droughts. Benjamin Franklin once said, we know the value of water when the well runs dry. Uh, and that's, that's very true. Drought losses can be horrible. In 2011, we had a drought in the state that just the loss from crop and livestock was $7.62 billion. That was just in one year. Not only that, that same year, we had wildfire <clears throat> fire losses that uh, hit $100, $500 million. Uh, there was 23,000 fires that year and uh, many millions of acres burned and 5.6 million urban sh uh, shade trees and a half a billion park and forest trees were killed during that drought. So it took a severe toll and that was just a one year drought. Uh, this was nothing compared to the 1950s. We had a drought in the state that lasted uh, six years from 1952 to 57 uh, that, that was very devastating. We also have a hydrological cycle for drought and it works similar to the floods. Uh, when you have a drought going on, uh, people are aware become aware of the drought. And uh, as the drought gets worse, people become concerned. And then when it gets even worse, then of course there's panic occurs. But then when rain happens, apathy sets back in and so the cycle starts over again. And unfortunately, we, do, we deal with droughts the same way we do it with floods. We, we have short memories. The last section is water quality contamination. That's an important issue. Uh, especially in the news when Barton Springs gets polluted or Barton Creek or one of the local streams gets polluted. There's a, uh, a lot of uh, news stories about it. <clears throat> Where does pollution come from? There's it's what's called two uh, point sources, one of them a non-point. A point source means it's coming from a point, like a discharge from a business industry or mining. Uh, it can be a gasoline storage tank. There's many of them that leak in this state, uh, a pipe that discharges fluid chemical spills. That's an example of a, what's called a point source pollution. Uh, other construction activities, waste dumps, even cemeteries can be a point source uh, contamination. Uh, as well as in this state, petroleum wells uh, have been a big threat to point source pollution. There's, there's brine, they have to dispose of the brine when they get the oil and there's spills of that. So in this state, uh, brine, uh, uh, hydrocarbon production is a, a definite point source. Non-point source is also the other urban development, constructions, sewage, automobile parking lots, pesticides, fertilizers. Uh, so that's, that's also a, a substantial source that's called non-point. As well as ranching and farming practices, pesticides, animal waste, uh, land use, construction activities. This is a big one, construction activities that cause a lot of pollution. So, of course, we have to have these things to live and survive, of course, but uh, it needs to be done in mediation. And so I'll en end up here with uh, careers and water resources. Those of you in mid and high school, if you're interested in, in water resources and earth science, you can study earth science, biology, chemistry uh, in your school. Uh, and then if you go to the university, uh, they have programs too. And a lot of people that study engineering, geology, geography, and biology can become hydrologists. And Austin Community College has an environmental science and technology department. They offer an associate of uh, science degree. It, it's a two year program. And so many of the people that go through this program end up being hydrologic technicians. So if you're interested in uh, water resources, but don't want to be a hydrologist, you can be a technician. Uh, in summary, I'll show, end up with this. Uh, there's a Native American proverb. I can't, I don't know which tribe it came from. I've, uh, no one seems to know. It said, treat the earth well. It was not given to you by your parents. It was loaned to you by your children. And I think that's a very substantial message and very pertinent uh, today, as well as when it was said probably 200 years ago. <laughs> so with that, uh, that concludes what I've got. Any questions or? Raymond, thank you so much. I, I uh, really appreciate your joining us and just kind of full disclosure, 
I, I was one of Raymond's students and I consider him a mentor and that inspired me in my interest in water resources. Um, I wanted to ask you, Raymond, to share with the students that are listening. Can you tell us what inspired you to become a hydrologist? Yeah, uh, I was always good in math uh, and I enjoyed physics and science when I was a child even, uh, but I wasn't sure how I was going to use that. But uh, when I was in high school, I had a friend whose father was a hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. And uh, so I asked him about it. And he p provided some information to me, some brochures and stuff, talking about the importance of water. And it dawned on me, yeah, water is pretty important stuff. So, <laughs> so when, even in high school, I realized that's what I wanted to do. And when I went to college, I went to work for the U.S. Geological Survey part-time as a hydrologic technician. And I did that for about two and a half years as a technician collecting data. Uh, at the same time, going to school to complete my degree. Uh, and uh, I studied uh, physics, math. I took meteorology, some geology, some geography courses, biology, uh, a lot of chemistry. So water covers a lot of different disciplines. Uh, and it requires a lot of knowledge. I'm still learning something every day. So it's a very challenging and very interesting career. And it's going to be even more important uh, in the future. So I would hope that uh, people can uh, <clears throat> take my place and continue on with the, with the work in water. <laughs> yes, and then thank you. And that's really a big goal we have with this program uh, is to inspire students to consider careers in geos. We call it geosciences. It's not just geology. We've had um, hydrologists, meteorologists, different disciplines that work together in the study of the earth. So I hope that uh, this has helped you in your studies. And to those, of, thank you, Raymond. I'll just say thank you so much for adding this talk to our series. We Let me add it. one more sentence. Uh, yes. What I didn't state, the importance of water is gonna be even more, uh, more significant in the future. Uh, there's floods are increasing in Texas, droughts are getting worse. Climate change is definitely having an impact on water resources. So it's gonna be much more important in the future than it is now. Oh, yes. And that's what makes it exciting. I know um, there's so many things that you could study in science, but in the earth sciences, you can have impact on people's lives. It's relevant to people's lives. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you very much. And for those of you watching on YouTube, if you have a question that we haven't answered, please leave a comment and we'll try to get an answer to you. And we also encourage you to look at the links uh, to our website. There'll be a link to this page on uh, water resources in Texas and issues and careers and others. And this is the last in our 2020 series. We have several other recordings. So if you would like to look at other topics, look at the Austin Earth Science Zoomerama. And thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>